Thank you very much for being here tonight. And uh, I must thank the Town Hall and Elliot Bay for organizing this, um, let's call it lecture, but uh, I think, you know, I would um, prefer to say this conversation because I'm sure there will be so many questions from uh, the audience. So I will try to um, summarize briefly what uh, uh, this book is all about, although it's small and many people thought it was an instant book. It's not. I worked uh, on terrorists for a very long time, um, since 1993. And the idea to write this book actually came to me um, over a year ago, before everybody discovered what the Islamic State was. And I went to my publisher, it was Seven Stories Press, and I said, I think we ought to write something about this phenomenon. And they said, what are you talking about? Of course, nobody knew. So um, in the end, they said yes, because they like me, I guess. <laughs> And they wanted to do only an e-book. Then all of a sudden, uh, the Islamic State became the topic. And uh, we didn't do only an e-book. Uh, we also sold this book in many countries. Um, so it's interesting how sometimes uh, um, people like me, just simple analysts, uh, can see things before you know, the big picture is presented to the politicians. And this is not good. <laughs> so. So um, let me begin with this. Now, we know that um, uh, President Obama at the moment is trying to find a way to bring back the troops in Iraq. So this is only eight months since we have discovered that the Islamic State existed. And all of a sudden, we're now considering you know, bringing back uh, our children, husbands, parents in that fight. Um, more than 10 years since 2003, since the fiasco of 2003, the invasion of Iraq, we now face an enemy which is actually much, much bigger, much more sophisticated. In fact, we are not facing an armed organization, as it was the case of Al-Qaeda, or the group from which the Islamic State comes from, the one created by al-Zarqawi. We're actually facing a state, and this is very important. This is the first armed organization which has successfully morphed into a state. So the modalities um, in which uses uh, terrorism are very different from the one used by an armed organization. Above all, I think this is a state, a terror state, a terrorist state that is a political animal like any state. So it takes opportunity, grabs opportunity as this opportunity presents themselves on the international arena. So it is a political animal. They understand the new world disorder. And to a certain extent, I think sometimes they understand it better than we do. And to um, explain this concept, I want to talk very briefly about what has happened with the hostages, the Japanese hostages, and of course the Jordanian pilot, because this is something that everybody, I'm sure, has followed on the newspaper. So um, I think that Japan and Jordan are the first political victim of this political animal. And indeed, I even think that the Islamic State has used a sort of terrorist diplomacy to create a particularly negative situation inside both Japan and Jordan. And I'll tell you why. Because both countries were actually willing to negotiate for the release of the hostages. Indeed, Japan was negotiating. The wife of Goto, who is the second hostage that was killed, the journalist, had received a letter from the Islamic State in October asking for $17 million in ransom. He had presented that letter to the Japanese government. And um, the prime minister, just two weeks ago, he admitted to parliament that he knew that God had been kidnapped and that the request for $17 million had been put forward by the Islamic State. 
Now, we don't know what was happening in Jordan, but it is very likely that the negotiation were taking place, because otherwise, why would Japan have gone to Jordan to ask for help to talk to the Islamic State? So a channel of communication in Jordan did exist. So all of a sudden, this negotiation came to a halt. And this happened in January of this year, when Prime Minister Abe of Japan went to the Middle East and pledged $200 million in humanitarian aid, this is very important, in the fight against the Islamic State. Now, um, the reason why he pledged $200 million in humanitarian aid is because there is an article in the Japanese constitution, which is article, article number nine, that prohibits Japan for using any military intervention or financial support for any military intervention apart from a situation where Japan is under attack. So that explains why Japan did not participate in uh, the war on terror, in the coalition put together by Bush. And this explains also why Japan has always been on the fringes of any kind of intervention against uh, armed organization outside Japan. Now, um, in uh, June of uh, last year, the Prime Minister proposed a change in the Constitution. He wanted to change Article 9 to give the possibility to Japan to participate in military activity outside the constraint of the Constitution. In other words, you know, to be part of the coalition against ISIS. That had created um, quite a lot of debate inside Japan, um, lots of opposition, and parliament has not as yet decided if we will revise Article 9 or not. So uh, all of a sudden, um, the speech becomes a way from the prime minister front of you know, changing the article to push the population of Japan and the parliament to accept the fact that Japan has to abandon this pacifist approach and has to be part of the Grand Coalition, um, in particular you know, against an enemy uh, like uh, the Islamic State, which is you know, the super enemy at the moment. So. Um, that means that the Islamic State knew what was happening in Japan. Now, I'm sure that uh, in uh, this auditorium, very few people knew. I didn't know either, <laughs> for example, that there was this easy debate. But this was a great opportunity, a great opportunity for the Islamic State to expose the contradiction between the government policy on one hand, who wanted to join, of course, you know, all this you know, coalition, um, who wanted to please also President Obama and the United States, and the population who actually is still traumatized by what has happened at the end of World War II. So in this way, the Islamic State has actually pushed itself inside a domestic policy dispute of Japan. And the damage that has done, we still don't know, because you know, we'll see how things will evolve. But for sure, it's a very big damage. Because he has shown the Japanese, watch it, if you change your policy, if you get involved in matters that have nothing to do with you, you will pay, and you will pay with the debt of your own people. And this is how you have to read the narrative of the videos that have been produced. Now, this is a state, Japan, that wanted to negotiate. This is not the United States or the United Kingdom. The only two countries that never negotiate any ransom are the US and the UK. And this is why you have seen those videos where you know, they cut the throat of other Americans or British. Everybody else, everybody else negotiates. 
Just one week before they killed the Japanese, the first Japanese hostage, two Italian um, girls who went there to work as aid workers had been released by the Islamic State. Of course, you know, the Italian government paid, you know, it still <laughs> says that they haven't paid, but you know, everybody knows that they have. And you saw what's happened uh, two days ago to the American aid worker, same age, she's gone, the two Italians are back home. This is what's happened on a daily basis. But in this particular circumstances, uh, the Japanese hostages have been treated exactly like the American and the British, because the Islamic State wanted to take an opportunity to scare the population of Japan, to give proof of its political strength. Now, um, for what concern Jordan, um, actually this is uh, to a certain extent even more complex politically speaking. Now, we know that the negotiations were going on, um, but we don't know at which level the negotiation had arrived. What we know is that all of a sudden, um, the Jordanian government was drawn into the negotiation between the Japanese and the Islamic State. And this is because, in reality, the Islamic State did not want to negotiate the release of any of those hostages. The requests were impossible to meet. 200 million in 72 hours uh, uh, to put together by the Japanese government. Then all of a sudden, the release of a prisoner which had been condemned to death uh, for you know, the uh, bombing in 2005 of the Radisson Hotel in Amman in exchange for a Japanese hostage. This has never happened before. No government will do something like that. So the conditions were purposely impossible to meet because the Islamic State wanted to kill those people. It wanted to prove that there is no way you can get off the hook with us. Now, why Jordan? Jordan actually is quite important. Um, the Islamic State, um, we can call it ideology or doctrine, is actually called radical Salafism. Radical Salafism is um, a very pure interpretation of Islam. They want to go back to the purity of the religion um, in order to get rid of everything that comes from outside, in particular Western influence. Now, I, I say in, in this book the, how radical Salafism came about. Initially, actually, Salafism was a movement of admiration towards the construction of the nation state in Europe. The Arabs looked at the European nation state in the 17th and 18th centuries with admiration, said, look, they have done such a, an amazing thing politically, and we, we are unable to produce uh, a new formula, something similar to what they have, you know, a real state, a cohesive state, a nation. Um, so they started to look at Europe as a sort of um, inspiration, but also to look at Europe in order to get some help uh, to build their own state. And the answer of the Europeans was, of course, colonization. So Salafism all of a sudden <laughs> became a sort of anti-Western movement, anti-colonial movement. But it was never so radical until the 1990s. In the second half of the 1990s, in Jordan, this is when we see the birth of radical Salafism. Now, the Jordanian government was the first government that recognized the right of Israel to exist in the Middle East. As a reaction to that decision, a new movement started, which is called radical Salafism. Now, al Zarqawi was a member of this movement, and he took this concept of radical Salafism into his own armed organization when in 2003 he moved into Iraq. So Jordan is considered by radical Salafists the number one enemy. It is the country, the first 
open to the West in accepting Israel, followed, of course, you know, by Egypt. So the tension between radical Salafis and Jordan is very, very strong. And this explains also why al-Zarqawi, when he established itself in in Iraq, he started to organize a suicide mission in Jordan. The idea was to destabilize you know, the Jordanian uh, government. So um, what the Islamic State has done by burning alive the pilot, I don't know if you have seen the video, um, it's absolutely shocking, it's a 22 minutes long video, and the only um, very, very end, the three minutes at the end, showed the burning of the Jordanian pilot. The um, previous part, uh, so the longest part, is actually a political statement against Jordan, showing the Jordanian government being a sort of poodle of you know, the United States, being the instrument of the West in the Middle East. Now, the, the video and the execution um, the burning is prohibited in Islam because the body is, has to be maintained for burial. So burning is quite a shocking and absolutely, it's almost insulting to the um, Islamic religion. So this was clearly a provocation. And uh, why do I say that? Well, I think you know, it's a provocation because it wants what the Islamic State wants, wants to draw Jordan into the fight. And in fact, the reaction of Jordan has been intensified bombing. Until a um, few weeks ago, the Jordanian um, Air Force was actually the most active air force in the coalition. 20% of the strikes had come from the Jordanians. But now it is you know, number one. Now actually Jordan has declared its own war against the Islamic State. That's what the Islamic State wants. It wants to draw Jordan into a conflict which eventually will destabilize Jordan by creating a sort of civil war similar to the one that was seen in Syria. There is a very strong support for radical Salafism in Jordan. And the situation today is very different from the situation in 2005 when there was the Radisson uh, bombing because Jordan now has, has a lot of refugees coming from Syria and from Iraq. So there is a very large population of refugees who are living in absolutely appalling conditions who the Islamic State believes can be mobilized in order to create a civil war scenario inside um, Jordan, similar to the one we've seen in Syria. So I told you this because I wanted to make clear that we're dealing with a political animal. So whatever we're doing has to be done bearing this in mind. Forget the barbarous uh, images. Forget what you read in the newspaper about these people being psychopaths. These people are not psychopaths. These people are politicians. And they are very skillful. And they use terror as a tool. So we need to find a new approach that is definitely different from the approach we have had until today. So let's go back a little bit and see how did we get to this level. I mean, how is it possible that you know, one day at the end of June, you know, we open the newspaper and we discover that somebody in the Middle East has, de has declared the caliphate, has knocked down the border between Iraq and Syria, border that, of course, was put in place by the French and the British in 1916. And uh, a new state was born out of terror. And of course, you know, none of us knew anything. So the story goes like this. From radical Salafism came Twaid al jihad And the, the name of the groups um, are very important, the semantic is very important. Twaid al jihad is the group that was created by al-Zarqawi in 2003 when he started to fight against 
the coalition forces, but also against the Shia. The Shia, this is a Sunni movement. The Shia are considered enemies because the Shias are apostates. They are not part of the same religion. They are actually considered even bigger enemies than the West. So they should be exterminated. This was the policy of al zarqawi and he is the one who actually started the sectarian war between the Sunni and the Shia in, um, in Iraq. Then uh, in 2005, um, um, Osama bin Laden welcomed al zarqawi into Al-Qaeda. And um, the group, Tuaid al jihad which in the meantime uh, changed its name into the Islamic State of Iraq, became Al-Qaeda in Iraq. Now, um, al zarqawi died in 2006. Uh, in 2007, uh, there was the surge and the Sunni awakening. The um, Sunni population was convinced by the United States to turn their back to the jihadists uh, in exchange for the promise to have a country run together by the Sunni and the Shia, even if the government, of course, you know, was a Shia government. So all of a sudden, these jihadists, including um, al-Qaeda in Iraq, started to lose power and um, to have problems. Now, al-Baghdadi, who is now the new caliph, uh, became a leader of this group uh, that was more or less uh, on the brink of extinction in 2010. And this was the group, the original group of al zarqawi which had, of course, you know, become Al-Qaeda in Iraq. Now, the story of al-Baghdadi is quite interesting. He was part of um, the al zarqawi group in Iraq until 2005 when he was arrested. And he ended up in a camp, which was um, an American-managed camp, prison camp, which was called Camp Buka. And he was there until 2010 with other groups from other jihadist uh, organizations. In 2010, everybody was released because the Americans decided to go home and the Iraqis did not know how to run the camp. So al-Baghdadi was released. And immediately, he became the leader of what today is the Islamic State. Um, so the first thing he did in 2010 was to abandon the name of al-Qaeda in Iraq and revert to the name the Islamic State of Iraq. Then he decided to cross over to Syria because, of course, the situation in Iraq was fairly bad and it was not possible to regroup and to reconstitute the original armed organization. But next door, of course, in Syria, there was a civil war which had just started. The really violent repression of the Arab Spring uh, by the Damascus government, by you know, the regime of Assad, had plunged the country into a civil war. Uh, this civil war immediately turned into a war by proxy because you know, various groups, various states started to fund various armed organizations. So we had on one side the supporter of Assad, which is Iran, who of course was bankrolling, as still does the Hezbollah, who moved from Lebanon into the north of Syria to protect the existing government. Then, of course, you know, we had Russia, who was backing financially and militarily the regime of Assad. Then we had Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Qatar, who actually wanted to overthrow Assad. And they started bankrolling jihadist groups who were fighting against Assad. Now, you see, it was very easy to shop around to get the best sponsor and the best money, and this is exactly what al-Baghdadi did. He moved over. <clears throat> he got enough sponsor. Um, so this is 2011. And instead of fighting the war by proxy that the sponsor wanted him to fight, he started to attack the other jihadist groups. 
And he did it because he wanted to establish the Islamic State of Iraq, that was the name at that time, as the strongest group. But also he wanted to conquer strategic territories. Strategic territories because rich in resources. So we're talking about oil for sure, but also water and also agricultural products. So the idea was if we conquer a territory that is big enough, that is rich enough, we can get rid of the sponsor and then establish our own state or the embryo of our own state. It was not interested in fighting Assad at all. It was interested in carving the embryo of the future caliphate, which is also what al zakawi wanted to do. This has always been the objective. So this is exactly what's happened. And then a certain point emerged with um, the, a group called Al-Nusra, which was the Al-Qaeda, let's say, affiliate, affiliate group in Syria. It was not really an Al-Qaeda group, but it was the group that was closest to Al-Qaeda. And from that merge, uh, was born ISIS, the Islamic State in Iraq, and Al-Sham, which means the Levant or Syria. And this is why um, some people use ISIL with the L for the Levant, and some other people use ISIS for, you know, Al-Sham. Now, all of this, of course, um, the semantic, um, tells you how this group, uh, slowly but surely, was evolving, was getting bigger, was also trying to establish itself as a state, which happened um, in June of 2014. Then all of a sudden, the day before the declaration of the caliphate, the name ISIS or ISIL disappeared and the Islamic State was the new name. That's a state, it is Islamic, and that's the state upon which we are building the caliphate. And the day after, you know, they declare the caliphate. Now, why did I, um, oh, and then the last thing I want to tell you is inside um, the Middle East, uh, um, people refer to the Islamic state as Daesh, which means the state. Some people say this is a negative, uh, um, way to describe it. Personally, I don't think so. I think, you know, the simple fact that they use the word state means that they accept the fact there is no any longer an armed organization. It is actually an entity which is a territory which is trying to build a nation. So it is a state. Uh, why do you think your president doesn't use the word Islamic State? Uh, none of the politicians are using that word because they don't want to admit that we're not dealing with an armed organization anymore, we're dealing with a state. So the use of ISIL, the use of ISIS uh, is actually to prevent admitting that they have been able to create a nation, so they actually you know, have succeeded in nation building where we, in the last 14 years, uh, have actually failed. Now that is important because this is all, <laughs> it's important because in the collective imagination of the West and the East, uh, all of these factors uh, are playing you know, an important role. So you can see that this organization, this state, this individual also, al-Baghdadi, are political animals because they, they managed to grab a, a great opportunity in Syria. They even crossed over to Syria. But the story doesn't finish um, with the creation of the caliphate. So let's go and see how this caliphate is run. How did they manage to conquer this vast territory? Um, well, they managed to conquer the territory um, pursuing a war 
of conquest, which is very traditional war of conquest, similar to the one of the Middle Ages. You know, they move into a territory, they attack uh, a town, they conquer the town, and then something happens. How do they run these towns? They do not run this territory that they conquered the same way that the Taliban did, oppressing the people. They are not dictatorial towards the people. On the contrary, they actually are very pragmatic. Now, of course, what they do is to produce a sort of a, a very homogeneous kind of state. So, you have to be Sunni, you have to be uh, a Salafist. Um, if you are a Shia, they offer you the opportunity to convert, which is more than Hitler offered to the Jews in Germany, I must say. If you do not want to convert, you can pay a tax and go away, and that's a source for the Christian, for any other religion. If you don't pay the tax, they kill you. Right, so, um, uh, this is a strategy that, uh, from the human point of view, is absolutely appalling. But if you want to build a state uh, out of scratch, and if you want this state to survive, uh, you have better chances if this state is ethnically, religiously, and ideologi ideologically very homogeneous. A multi-ethnic society is much more difficult. Now, that is the pragmatism you know, that they use. Um, at the same time, they do not want to rule the people in the same way that the Taliban did. So you can watch TV, you can use, you know, on the contrary, actually, you know, they welcome any use of technology, as we all know. Um, but they seek consensus. They want people not necessarily to be happy or content, but they want people to be satisfied with what they have. So they, what they do is they immediately fix all the basic infrastructure, so they give you electricity, water. Now, we're talking about war-torn areas. We're not talking about places like you know, where we live. We're talking about places um, that plunge into anarchy, uh, villages ruled by warlords, uh, plagued by criminal gangs, uh, where law and order doesn't exist anymore. Then the Islamic State comes, you know, brings law and order, which is the Sharia law, which is well accepted because you know most of this population, most of this tribal population, uh, they do apply the Sharia within their everyday life, and then uh, they fix the infrastructure, they give a certain kind of normality to the everyday life. They even vaccinate children against polio, something that you know, the Taliban do. You know. So I know that this is shocking. I think it is absolutely shocking for you because you know, all we see of the Islamic State is the barbarous behavior, but there is another phase. And this is the one that we have to look, because this is what makes this state so strong where it is. This is what makes the population actually, you know, accepting the fact that they are there. And this is also what is going to make very difficult for us to bring about another Sunni awakening similar to the one of 2007. These tribes will not believe us anymore because, you know, we promised them that you know, there would be a democratic regime in Baghdad, and there wasn't. And we knew that the Shia government of Maliki was doing incredibly um, bad things towards the Sunni, um, massive discrimination, and we didn't do anything. I mean, you know, we just left and said, okay, now it, it is your problem. Um, unfortunately, it, it seems that you know this problem is coming back to to our home. So I told you all of this because there is something else that we must understand: is why so many young people are joining this state. I mean, why so many European young Muslim, uh, even American young Muslim? all of a sudden, you know, are joining this fight. I mean, you saw in those videos that people coming from all over the world, they're coming from Australia, New Zealand, Chile, South America, all these young people. 
And, and there is a certain kind of seduction. This is what I say in the book. There's a certain kind of seduction. And this seduction comes from the fact that for the first time in centuries, the Sunni Muslim utopia is taking shape in a state. That dream of al Nada to create a state is all of a sudden taking shape. And if you listen to the speech of al-Baghdadi, the day in which he declared the birth of the caliphate, it's a very positive speech. He says, this is your state, come. Help us build this state. He didn't ask for people to, as Al-Qaeda did, you know, come and blow yourself up and live for seven, um, with 72 virgins for eternity. Not at all. He said, come, help us build your state. You will have a family, you will have a wife, you will have children. And these children will live in this state. Now, if you are a young Muslim... Um, in a world that is increasingly difficult for everybody, but you know your family comes from uh, um, I don't know, North Africa, the Middle East, so and you feel you don't belong to that part of the world, but equally you do not belong to the West because you're different from the Western people. You come from a different culture. You feel a sort of misfit. You don't know what to do. You don't know. To whom do you belong? And then all of a sudden, this message comes to you. So the message that goes to these young people, close to radicalization, not radicalized yet, is not the message that we perceived. It's not the message of the people being killed. It's actually the message of building a state. It's a patriotic call to a state that will offer deliverance to every single Muslim after centuries and centuries of colonization, humiliation, I mean, you name it. And that is the appeal. Now, of course, you know, this may not be true. It doesn't matter. What we're looking at here is at how people are lured into this dream. And I think this is very, very strong. And I also think that if we want to fight them, we have to fight on this terrain also. Bombing is not going to be the best solution. Why are these people going there? We must fight that kind of seduction. So we have a double message. A message of terror for us, a message of hope for you know those that join the Islamic State, and the role of the media. Well, we we know that the media has been completely manipulated by them. In that, I think they show a great modernity. I mean, they're modern in the way they use technology, but they also they're modern in the way they spin the media. Um, in reality, uh, what we have seen from the beginning, uh, even now, is that the media is constantly catching up uh, with you know what's happened on social media, what's happened on Facebook, what's happened on Twitter. They are always a step ahead. And by catching up, the media is trying to make things uh, more exceptional. So the, the barbarous behavior is making it look even bigger th than it is. Uh, everything is sensational. So that at the end of the day, we get even more and more scared. And nobody actually is thinking anymore. Everybody is reacting uh, instinctively out of fear. And that's exactly what's happening in Japan. This is also what's happening in Jordan. Even governments react. I mean, the idea that President Obama now is asking Congress for you know, sending more troops is also, if you think about it, is a gut reaction. <laughs> we have a coalition of 66, 66 countries. And we need, and is not enough against the Islamic State? Do you see what I mean? I mean, you know, we, sh we really need to rationalize in order to understand exactly what is happening, know your enemy, number one, and number two, of course, uh, it'll find different ways, more um, 
clever ways to fight than you know, the simple bombing. So, um, to conclude, I guess that you understood that I am not in favor of a military intervention. <laughs> I spent the last um, uh, 12 years um, uh, trying to convince people that the invasion of Iraq was wrong. In fact, you can see there are lots of books out there. And I think I will spend the next 13 years to convince people that this is also wrong. I mean, this doesn't work. I mean, it hasn't worked in 2003. Why should it work today? What has changed? And this is why the title is The Islamic Phoenix, because this is a phoenix. I mean, we thought, you know, we have solved the problem. You know, they're not there anymore. There were no attacks in the West. Uh, everything was okay. And then all of a sudden, they came back much, much stronger. And the same thing is going to happen if we carry on with the military intervention. So what can be the solution? Well, I think you know, the solution has to be, for sure, integration in the West. We need to go back to that concept of a multi-ethnic society as a very strong society. This is our modernity, multi-ethnic society. Well, you know, we're going exactly the opposite way. Look, I live in Europe, so I can talk until tomorrow about you know, how things are going bad. But integration is the key to prevent these young people from going to join. And look, the foreign fighters are very important, um, not only because there are many, but also because the foreign fighters are quite wealthy. They are the ones that bring money from family, friends, and supporters. So it is a source of revenues. And yes, the Islamic State has oil, has, is a state, so I mean, it's running basically a state. Um, but at the same time, this is a link with the West, uh, which is bad for us and is good for them. Um, the other way, the other strategy, it is um, to use diplomacy. I mean, not the diplomacy that uh, we know, <laughs> the Cold War kind of um, diplomacy that we still have today, but a sort of 19th century diplomacy. Um, people that work um, not directly, but you know, they go around different political uh, figures. For example, in the case of uh, um, the Islamic State, do we know what they really want? How big they want to get? What is their goal? We have no idea. So, a 19th century um, diplomacy would actually try to get in touch with the tribal leaders who are very close to the Islamic State in order to understand what is their objective. Is it possible to establish a dialogue with these people, uh, at least to understand? And then, you know, is it possible to, um, I wouldn't say to accept that this state exists, because that would be absolutely premature, but to, see if the state is intention to redraw the map of the Middle East in the same way that he has redraw the map of the northern Syria and northern Iraq, or if he's actually trying to bring about um, a pricing in the neighboring countries, for example, Saudi Arabia. But at the end of the day, the redrawing of the map of the Middle East will take place. And I think, uh, it has to be done by them. This is their fight. It is not our fight. We drew those borders after World War I and World War II, and we are today paying the consequences of those borders. So we can influence, through diplomacy, the redrawing of that map. But at the end of the day, they have to do it themselves. And that may require also war. It's possible. I don't think in the short run there's going to be any peace, not at all. But if we carry on being involved, then you know, the problem will compound. It will get bigger and bigger. And remember, the Islamic State is the product of this policy. If we had not gone into Iraq in 2003, I would not be here telling you this story. 
Okay. And to conclude, I would not have written all those books either. <laughs> Thank you. I wonder what you think the uh, fallout from the, there's 28 pages of the 9-11 report that implicate the Saudis as being, yeah. in fact, I think the present king uh, being finance, big financiers of the 9-11 attack. Uh, I, I don't, um, I don't think that the Saudis funded 9-11, uh, uh, but um, the Saudi did play a very big role in the uh, creation of Al-Qaeda when, of course, that was an organization in Afghanistan. Um, to, I mean, it was the Saudis together with the CIA. They actually funded the Mujahideen, and Al-Qaeda was one of the organizations that basically was used to funnel the funds coming from Saudi Arabia, mostly from charitable organizations in Saudi Arabia. Then, of course, when the anti-Soviet jihad ended, uh, Al-Qaeda was not disbanded. And the idea was that the Mujahideen would go back to their native lands and start revolutions inside. For example, that's the case of um, um, Algeria. Um, so the Saudis always played a um, a role, um, not necessarily the royal family alone, but members of the royal family. Uh, this was like, you know, their pet projects, you know, little armed groups uh, that do what we want them to do uh, in order to promote uh, um, our vision of Islam. Um, but no, I don't think there was direct involvement with 9-11. Yeah, I wanted to follow up on your the very last topic that you discussed in your in your talk about the 2003 invasion leading very directly to this. So I, I just wanted to follow up. Are you suggesting, or, or do you believe that once we invaded in 2003 and elevated the Shi'i at, at, at the expense of the uh, Sunni, that it became inevitable essentially that something like this would happen, or do you think there were steps subsequent to that? maybe more effort with the awakening councils, maybe longer presence, maybe earlier intervention in Syria or some combination of things that the United States could have done that could have precluded this from happening. So. I, I don't think we should have invaded at all because there was absolutely no link bet between uh, Al-Qaeda and Saddam Hussein. On the contrary, um, I think we wanted to, to get rid of Saddam Hussein because he had turned against us. So he was not any longer... Um, the, the kind of leader that we wanted in that place. Now, if we had left, I mean, we have to go back to the sanction also. You know, we also impose sanction. Um, it's a long story. I mean, the, the reason why Iraq has become progressively more and more uh, religious um, in terms of fundamentalism is because of the sanction also. Um, you know, Saddam Hussein had to do something to keep, you know, the tribal leaders who were, you know, his most important supporters, um, happy. And a way was, you know, to promote uh, their vision of Islam. Um, I mean, I used to go to Iraq for work a lot bef before the sanctions were imposed, and I can guarantee you that yeah, it was not an Islamic country at all. I mean, w women were not veiled. Of course, you know, if you went to Basra or you know, Mosul, you may see them in certain areas, but you know, women worked. Um, the ethnicity, also, people in I position was you know, different. So we had Christians, they were Shia. So I think you know that the, the degeneration of um, Iraq is very much related to our policy. We want a regime change, we want a nation building, and we failed tremendously. And yes, then you know, at the end, the 2007, which was a good idea, the Sunni awakening was definitely a good idea. But then we didn't respect um, that bargaining contract that we had done. Um, and it's not because we left. We could have done it from uh, Washington. It's because we were not interested. And this is something that we do over and over and over again. We go, we make a mess, and then we come home. And I mean, this is, this is what I said about diplomacy. This is the Cold War diplomacy. 
because you know, during the Cold War, you know, you had two sphere of influence, you know, one inside and the other one outside. And we could do something like that because there was really no alternative. But now the world is so complex, so complicated. The reason why um, the US could not intervene in Syria is because the Chinese in the Security Council said, you're not doing what you have done in, in Libya again. That's it, finished. <laughs> so you see what I mean about we should not have done any of that. Now we have done it, we got to change completely the policy because the world is not any longer as it was before. Thank you. This has really been a very interesting analysis. Oh, thank you. Um, but yet the parallels are very ironic and ludicrous if one uses some critical thinking. Like, for instance, this summary uh, that was presented to us. If one substituted Israel for every reference to the Islamic State, one could see so many similarities. And I'm asking for your response on this. And just to shorten this, uh, and then you concluded that the suggestions of how we, the US, and other Western powers, if we focused on integration, multi-ethnic focus, and diplomacy and dialogue, how we could move forward in progress with Israel in the middle of the Middle East and the Islamic State, which has become more and more demonized, misunderstood, and the Muslims. So thank you, appreciate your response. Um, well, um, I don't think that, uh, that we are um, in this coalition, I don't think we, we have formed this coalition to protect Israel. We actually have done it to protect Saudi Arabia. So, you know, <laughs> the all emphasis has completely shifted, I think. Now, the Islamic State has not said anything against Israel. I mean, it's not Iran. Um, it's not Al-Qaeda. It's interesting to see how both Israel and the Islamic State are avoiding uh, a confrontation. Even in words, even diplomatically speaking. The reason why this coalition exists is because Saudi Arabia all of a sudden has become seriously afraid of uh, this Frankenstein which has created. Now, if you remember correctly, um, there was a press conference uh, um, at the end of August. I think it must have been like the 28th of August, something like that, um, in which uh, President Obama said, we do not have a policy, I mean, we do not have a strategy vis-a-vis -vis the Islamic State. And that was, you know, big news the day after. A week later, he went around the world to form the Grand Coalition. Think about. The US had no intention to be drawn into this, but he had to, because, you know, Saudi Arabia is our ally. And all of a sudden, that week, you know, between, you know, these changes, we had, you know, the troops from Saudi Arabia, you know, being deployed in the north of the country for fear that the Islamic State was actually coming at the border with Iraq. So I don't think that for the moment this is for Israel. I think it is for our Gulf allies and in particular for Saudi Arabia. Um, for what um, diplomacy, dialogue, uh, yes, I think, you know, War should always be the last option, the one that you cannot avoid, should never be the first one. Can we somehow start a 30-year war between the Shia and the Sunni? <laughs> uh, that solved the problem in the 16th century between the Catholics and the Protestants, so maybe it's, maybe it's a thought. Uh, yeah, I think yeah, there is a, um, <laughs> it seems very similar. Um, I said, actually, I discussed this in the book about um, insurgent Iraq, into the one I wrote in 2005. Um, there are lots of similarities 
between the war between uh, the Catholic and the Protestant uh, in Europe. Um, but um, I, I, I don't think that that would be a solution. <laughs> I, don't think, I don't think the idea that they should kill each other is a solution, no. I mean, they're still human beings. <laughs> So uh, my question is about how can we break their backbone? Because finance is the backbone of every institution, organization. So who is supporting these terrorists financially? Who is buying their oil and how they're getting, how can we crush their backbone financially? And I think that will be a biggest tool, I think, for now. Yeah, yeah I think it is a very good question. But unfortunately, in, they manage to do what I described um, as the privatization of terrorism. So at a certain point, they didn't need the money of the sponsor anymore um, because they're running a state. So imagine this is a territory that is bigger than Texas. And inside this territory, the Islamic State, uh, um, is the state. So, you know, it levies taxes. Uh, I mean, you, you need to go to court. I mean, you know, there are, of course, uh, um, Islamic courts with judges. You need to go to court because you have a dispute with your neighbor. Um, you pay <laughs> in order to have access to that system of justice, and, and the money are collected by the Islamic State. So that's just one of the many examples. Uh, the exploitation of resources uh, is done through joint venture with the tribal leaders. Um, so the tribal leaders organize um, the running of these resources, for example, smuggling of oil. But the Islamic State gets a percentage out of that business. So, you know, we could have, we could have stopped uh, the money going from A to B before 9-11, if we had known, right? But now we can't stop what happens inside a state. I mean, I'll give you another example. They conquer the north of Iraq at the beginning of the summer. And they conquer that region <coughs> between the Tigris and the Euphrates where there is 40% production of wheat of Iraq. So as you know, all of these countries, they control the price of uh, bread. So the price, so wheat is bought uh, by the central government, who then sells flour at a set price. So the government of Baghdad could not be without forty percent of the yearly production of wheat. So they had to make a deal, and they actually bought the wheat from the Islamic State, because otherwise they were going to be short of forty percent and the price of wheat would have gone up, and of course, price of bread would have gone up. In the meantime, you know, the neighboring Islamic state would have sold its bread at rock bottom prices. So you see, I mean, because it is a state, it's very, very difficult to cut its finances because it's financing, because it's self-financing itself. That's why we need a different strategy. Hi, I'm Hi. a high school history teacher. I've got a bunch of my students in the back wow. too who are excited to be here. And we're, we've been studying Nasser in the 1950s and 60s and how his vision was an Arab state. Mm -hmm. And it Pan became Arabic, so yeah. complicated to do because of the people who thought he was too Arab and not enough Muslim. There was the West leaning and the East leaning. And uh, I wonder if you see this as kind of uh, a, a counterpoint to that. So this is not an Arab nationalism, but a Muslim nationalism. Or yeah, yeah. So th th this is um, is more global, I would say. So pan Arabism was um, geographically limited because, of course, we were during the Cold War, so you couldn't have gone you know, too far. But this one, I think, is. Um, I mean, what I say in the book is, to a certain extent, the message that they're launching wants to be similar to the message that Zionism launched to the Jews before the constitution of Israel. So, you know, at the end of World War II, but also in the interwar period when they were trying to negotiate. Because the idea is we, um, need to go back to our land 
because by creating a nation, which is our nation, we offer deliverance to all the diaspora that is all over the world. I think they're doing the same thing. So there is a diaspora all over the world. So I'm building this state, and this state will offer deliverance, but also will protect. So I don't think that they want, as many say, they want to recreate the caliphate the same way the caliphate was um, in the 10th century. Uh, I don't think they want to get to Rome. I don't think you know they want to destroy Christianity. I mean, these are all things that you know, circulate in social media. But I do think that their great appeal is the fact that they want to create this uh, state uh, in the original land. If you have the Arab Spring and the, the revolution in Egypt in 2011, and the suppression for so long of the Muslim Brotherhood, are there, is there a way to like hook that up? In well, the I, well I, think, uh, I think what you're saying is very interesting because we have the Arab Spring, uh, the suppression of the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, which is a complete utter failure of a democratic movement. <laughs> While we have the Islamic State, which uses violence and terrorism, which so far is a great success. So if you are a young Muslim uh, and you look at these two things, uh, what are you going to do? Hi, thank you for your time. Um, do you agree with the argument that uh, the West drew the borders of the Middle East to ensure that there was constant unrest within and between the countries? And um, also, I'd like your, your uh, comments on, on kind of a, a um, compare and contrast with uh, the Islamic State with, uh, like, the Ottoman Empire, who also, you know, use the same um, tactics, such as taxing uh, those, or, or you can convert, or, you know, whatnot, and, and bringing um, the acceptance that they're there, you know, in that kind of a, of a way. So could, could you repeat the first question because I missed something. Yeah, right? um, there's, there's an argument out there that um, the Western nations uh, drew the borders of the Middle East and North Africa to ensure that there was um, internal... Social unrest. Yes. Right. Um, okay, so um, uh, I don't think um, that that's true. I, th I think, you know, the, 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 the borders were created... Uh, in order to offer Western countries uh, um, a certain kind of advantages. So they were drawn for our own interests. So it's, uh, we can call it you know, the second stage of colonization, right? So you, know, you do not uh, um, maintain political control over those regions, but you put somebody there will assure your um, uh, multinationals <laughs> the access to the resources uh, that you know you want to co continue to control um, and those borders were also drawn by people who had absolutely no knowledge of the culture the religion the ethnicity uh, I mean you know see the, the, what the Islamic State has done, has been linking uh, uh, tribal communities uh, who are ethnically the same, uh, but one was uh, in Syria and the other one was in Iraq. I mean, that, all that region, uh, if, you, if you go there and if you travel there, you can see that even naturally, even geographically, there shouldn't be a border. It's one big stretch of desert, and then these two rivers uh, in the middle, uh, which is all uh, very homogeneous. Uh, and then they cut it. You know, they, they made a line, saying, OK, you know, this side is Syria, this other side is Iraq. So uh, the same thing is the Jordanian um, monarchy. I mean, the Jordanian monarchy claims to come from Mohammed. So does al-Baghdadi. Everybody claims to come from Mohammed. You know? uh, but, but the Jordanian uh, uh, monarchy was put there by the British. 
uh, so um, the house of Saud uh, uh, is there because he conquered that part of uh, uh, of the region uh, uh, through a sort of war or conquest backed by a religious and very, very fundamentalist religion, uh, religious interpretation of Islam, which is Wahhabism. Um, so, but in the old days, uh, all that peninsula was actually one region with nomadic uh, tribes. So, uh, I don't think the Islamic State wants to recreate uh, that kind of environment, but I think the Islamic State is trying to do is saying, okay, you know, we go back to the seventh century Arabia, which was, you know, when, you know, the caliphate started, when, you know, yes, there were, you know, nomadic tribes, and then we start building uh, a very homogeneous state, but this is the 21st version, uh, 21st century version of the caliphate. Um, what was the other question uh, that you asked me about um, the Ottoman Empire? Um, I, 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 I don't know if... I, I think they're running a state uh, in a modern way. So uh, as close as possible to how we run a state. So consensus, uh, which the Ottoman Empire never, never consider. Um, and that's, I think, is a key point, a key point you know, to get the population to back you. Um, and um, the financial side, uh, I think it is through taxation, but not, I mean, the case of the Ottoman Empire, of course, there was great uh, discrimination from one region to another, uh, and also was very oppressive. Uh, well, from what I understand from you know, my research, I don't think that this is a, is a state that financially is oppressing people. On the contrary, it's actually giving people opportunities. This is why the exploitation of the resources is not done by the state, so it's not like a communist kind of of system whereby you know I'm the state, I own all the resources, this is all mine. No, you know, I actually start doing joint venture with you because at the end of the day this is your state. So I think in that also they're different. Buonasera, sono il Napolitano. So Sorry? Um, welcome. Thank you. Um, I'm thinking about what you said with the solutions, and I want to have you expand on that relative to assimilation and diplomacy in, the, in this context. I think when you allude to diplomacy, you probably think of the public kind of John Kerry running around the United States asking ev ev the world, asking everyone to play nice in the sandbox. Mm -hmm. And what I'm about to say is, is not meant to be cynical, but serious as I've tried to catch up on my own understanding of history. Much of our diplomacy is through the CIA. Um, we drew the maps of the Middle East after World War I. We disposed a pretty democratically elected government in Iran in 1952, all through the CIA. We put mm -hmm. Saddam Hussein in power through the CIA. And all of that, we're, we the people will almost always be 25 to 35 years behind because they get to protect all of that through secrecy, none of which is in our constitution. So how do we... What kind of diplomacy are we talking well, about? Well, that kind of diplomacy you're referring to doesn't work anymore because there is no Cold War anymore. And proof to that is that we wanted to go into Syria. We wanted to have a regime change in Syria. And we said, I mean, the U.S. said, we'll go in if they use chemical weapons. Well, they did use chemical weapons. And the CIA couldn't do anything. About that. In fact, the CIA didn't even notice that the Islamic State was ex was there, <laughs> if I'm not mistaken, because you know I haven't seen anything happening in 2011, 2012, 2013. This is what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that diplomacy that we use during the Cold War, and this is also from the other side, because the other side did the same thing. Absolutely. So that diplomacy doesn't work anymore because we live in a multipolar society. We have to deal with new powers 
who are almost as powerful as we are. So we didn't go into Syria because China blocked us. China does not belong to the coalition, for example. It's very interesting. Every single country you can think of is part of the coalition, but the Chinese are not interested. So we need to go back to the 19th century. So 19th century diplomacy was a diplomacy of a multipolar world. Now, we didn't have you know, China, but we had you know, all the powers in Europe. Uh, we had you know, the, the United States. Uh, I mean, and they were constantly, we had Russia, of course. They were constantly fighting each other in order to maintain a certain kind of equilibrium. Um, that is the kind of diplomacy that we need in order to, I'm not saying in order to destroy the Islamic State, because I don't think that something like this can be destroyed. You know, we may destroy this uh, incarnation, but it will keep coming back. The map of the Middle East needs to be redrawn, because it is a map that belongs to a world that doesn't exist anymore. That was the Cold War. We are in a new phase of history, and we got to understand that the Middle East is one of the many regions that needs to, to have a new political um, structure. I mean, whatever is there today. And we saw with the um, Arab Spring, and we seen with this. So it, it, it is a world on fire. And I could say the same thing of Europe. I could say that you know, what is happening in Europe with the concept of the European Union is also in need of change. So you see, it's a, I mean, we can expand this discussion to the Ukraine, to what is happening with Russia. I mean, you see what I mean? It's like shifting sands constantly. Nothing like this ever happened during the Cold War. The Cold War was just, you know, yes, you may have had a terrorist organization, war by proxy, at the periphery of the sphere of influence in countries that are not important. But look what's happened today with the, the Ukraine. I mean, we potentially we have the United States going to war with Moscow for a country, the Ukraine, which is broke, frankly. $12 billion from the IMF three months ago are already gone completely. If you think about in terms of the Cold War, no. So that's what I mean about new diplomacy. We've got time for two more questions. Okay. Um, do you see any resolution with the serious civil war? And you've been out, you know, the, you've been pretty clear that West should be non-interventionist. Should the West just take a hands-off policy toward the Syrian civil war and Assad? Yes, I think uh, we should not. <sighs> You know, the thing is, we don't know who we're funding. I mean, all of a sudden, you know, we discovered that the Islamic State had knew how to use the most modern American weapons who were given to the Iraqis. I mean, you know, we don't know what's going on there. Uh, so we're giving money to the Kurds. Uh, we're giving money to the PKK, which is still a terrorist organization listed by the State Department, it's just, to me, it looks completely shambolic, they all think, you know? I mean, you know, just give money and then, you know. No, it's just, it doesn't work like this. These are terrorist organization. These are people, these are professional also. So now we have the Islamic State who has become a state because you know, Saudi Arabia and all our allies in the Gulf you know, were funding them. Now we're funding the Kurds so that maybe in five years we'll have the Kurds trying to carve their own state uh, out of uh, Turkey, Iran, and Iraq. Uh, it's just, I don't know, just, I don't know. I, Thanks so much for speaking tonight. Um, I'm wondering, uh, since you have observed the workings of the Islamic State, 
uh, and we know um, about uh, jihadi weddings. Uh, would you talk about the status and the situation of women within that state? <laughs> Well, I mean, this is actually a very good question because if you think about, right, that's the media again. So the media says, oh, you know. Um, no, it's more than the media. No, 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 but no, I'll tell, well, whatever. I mean, I'm saying the media because it's reported in the media because I don't think well, you have been to it. I pay attention to mainstream media. I do pay attention to women's groups in the region. Yeah, okay. So in any case, <clears throat> the idea is that uh, uh, you're a fighter, you go, actually I have a, a, a chapter in the book that talks about, uh, the, it's called the New Rome. And if you remember, um, Rome was um, founded by a bunch of thieves. Right? They were all criminals. Uh, they were all men and they founded Rome and then all of a sudden, uh, they wanted to build a state, but they didn't have women. And without women, you can't build anything because you can't have a family. So they went to the nearby region, the Sabina, and uh, they kidnapped the women of the local tribes and brought them back and forced them into marriage. So of course, you know, the tribes of the Sabina decided to attack Rome and the women stopped them. The women stopped them. They said, no, we don't want this bloodbath. These are our husbands, and you know, we'll stay with them. And this is how Rome was built. This is one of the story, well, no, no, no. Don't, well, look, don't look at me like this. This is documented history, and this is what you learn in school. Made, you've made some comparisons of other empire building and the contrasts, and I, I don't think this is a, is a matching context for what you Well, I think it context. is. I think it is. If you want to build a state, well, and I, you are... Well, that part is clear, yeah. But, okay, can I answer the question, or do you want to answer your question? <laughs> I mean, as you prefer. It doesn't matter to me. No, I, I want to, to hear what you have to say, but in a way that relates, as you've done in other questions, how you've distinguished this uh, state building from other state buildings far back in history. Uh, well, that's what I was doing. <laughs> you asked me specifically about the jihadist wedding. Jihadis uh, from the Islamic State marrying uh, women from the region, right? That was the question. Uh, yeah, that's one aspect of it that I mentioned, but it isn't like nice weddings. It isn't like, it isn't <laughs> like they come willingly or their families yield them willingly or that they're not. Well, I mean, this, uh, okay, uh, I, I don't, you know, I can't comment on that, but these are tribal societies where women do not marry for love. They marry for arranged marriages organized by their family. Now, if their family chooses a jihadist warrior or he chooses the guy around the corner who is selling cigarettes, it's still the family that decides. You know, I always remember Benazir Bhutto who was an incredibly intelligent woman, highly educated, president of the Foreign Student Association of uh, Oxford University, who defended the fact that she married somebody based upon an arranged marriage by her family. Now, we got to accept that there are different cultures, and love doesn't play a role in these societies. I mean, you know, I, I, <laughs> I, I don't want to, uh, to, to sound, uh, look, you know, I, I was a founding member of the Italian feminist movement, so he's, you know, but we got to accept the fact that the world is not a carbon copy of our world, and that it takes generations and generations uh, in order to achieve equality between the sexes. But 
that is their fight again. You know, we conquer equality because we fought for equality. It was not handed over to me by, you know, the Americans or the Russians or anybody else. We in Italy, you know, I was born in a country in 1955 in which for sure, you know, the boy had m more privileges than the girl. My brother could do anything. I couldn't. I fought for, you know, my privileges. It was, they were not handed over to me. I fought and I paid pr prices for that also. You know, I went to Japan recently and I had to give a speech on this topic to a school of, um, of women because, you know, the teachers wanted them to know my experience because Japanese women are, they tend to follow what their father or, you know, their male members of the family tells them to do. And that's Japan. So, you know, but at the end of the day, you tell them, you explain them, and then the fight is their fight. We cannot export democracy, equality. We can only export Coca-Cola. 